In my talk, I'm going to start by just defining what we mean by vulnerable populations, describe some of the data that we have around disparities in HIV care and treatment, and then highlight some evidence-based approaches to improving HIV care and treatment among these populations, and then briefly uh, some conclusions. So how do we define vulnerable populations? I thought about this a lot when I was putting the talk together. Uh, if you look it up on uh, Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, vulnerable is a Latin word. It means capable of being physically or emotionally wounded or open to attack or damage. And I never thought about it that way. Um, I uh, do mostly research, and so from a research standpoint, I think about a vulnerable population as those that are human subjects that require additional protections. So those might be pregnant women, children, prisoners. Um, the common rule that we all follow with human subjects research describes them as people who are educationally, economically, and decisionally disadvantaged. Um, and so I think it's also interesting, there's been some work by some Gupta and colleagues who interviewed a lot of um, HIV trialists to get their perspectives on what it means to be a vulnerable population. And one of the themes that they came up with was that vulnerability really is situational um, and that it's not always group-based vulnerability in the way that we kind of put people in different buckets. Okay. So here I just wanted to briefly show you a conceptual framework for vulnerability. This is um, a framework that was developed by King and colleagues. And here they propose that vulnerable populations end up with poor health outcomes and result in disparities based on a myriad of different factors. So that might be a uh, physical environment, their social environment, stressors that they um, have in everyday life, and that it's really a balance between oppression and resiliency that will determine whether or not somebody is vulnerable and ultimately influence their, um, their health disparities. So I think in the context of vulnerability for HIV, as we're going to talk about today, um, you know, we have different groups of vulnerability. I think traditionally we refer to people, and I put quotes around it, as high-risk populations. Um, we see a lot of data, and I'll show you some, that categorize people as high-risk who are men who have sex with men, injection drug users, um, high-risk heterosexuals, and then of course there are these groups that are larger, women, children, racial and ethnic minorities, immigrants, commercial sex workers, um, and sexual minorities, such as transgendered persons. And so we refer to these as traditional high-risk populations. In the international context, you might hear them referred to now more so as key populations, which seems to be a little bit more um, politically correct. But I would um, argue that there are obviously other issues that make someone uh, vulnerable in the context of HIV. And you know these can be social determinants of health. Of course, we're talking a lot about comorbidities and co-infections with uh, HIV and Hep C or Hep B, um, access to health care, uh, housing instability, geographic disparities. All of this can um, predispose someone to being more vulnerable in the context of HIV. And then, of course, there's situational and experiential uh, factors. So, you know, does a person um, deal with daily discrimination and racism and implicit or unconscious bias? Um, are they dealing with stigma? Are they, um, you know, living with trauma? Are they, um, you know, dealing with intimate partner violence? All of these things can make people vulnerable to HIV. So I want to spend a little bit of time showing you some of the data, some of its, most of its national data, um, describing the disparities in HIV care and vulnerability. So CDC, of course, has um, given us uh, a glimpse of uh, the national data and, and HIV. Here we have the map of HIV incidents among people who are over the age of 13, and you can see that there are geographic disparities in terms of HIV incidents. So we see higher rates of HIV, uh, higher rates of new HIV infections um, in the darker purple colors. And there are really only five states that account for over half of new diagnoses of HIV, California, Texas, Georgia, Florida, and New York. We, of course, are all familiar with these racial and ethnic uh, differences in HIV incidents. So again, this is a graph from CDC showing us that while blacks and African Americans account for only 13% of the US population, they account for 
of all new HIV infections. And similarly, among the Hispanic and Latino population, 18% of the population, yet they account for 27% of new diagnoses. So we know, of course, there are no biological differences in somebody's vulnerability or racial ethnic differences in someone's vulnerability uh, with respect to HIV. So again, I think that's why it's important to understand some of these other contextual factors. Um, additional data, when we drill down and we look at young persons, 13 to 24, who are living with HIV, of course, we see disparities and differences between males and females. So here in the young population, we see the vast majority, 82% of infections are due to males, um, men having sex with men, whereas for females, about 50% of our diagnoses are among females who are 13 to 24 years of age. And I wanted to point out, I think this is a, um, a very sobering um, analysis from CDC showing the lifetime risk of HIV diagnosis. I remember when these were released at CROI um, a couple of years ago, in which they did an analysis which found that one in six men who have sex with men will, will be diagnosed with HIV in their lifetime. And then when you break it down further by race and ethnicity, one in two African American men who have sex with men and one in four Hispanic men who have sex with men will have HIV in their lifetime. So again, these data are very telling and of course um, help us focus our efforts around HIV prevention, care, and treatment. Um, we're all very familiar with the HIV care continuum. I think it's a good way for us to help monitor our approaches and success in treating people who are living with HIV. Uh, again, I think that this also presents an opportunity for us to identify where there are gaps or disparities in HIV care. So again, data from CDC, if you look at the care continuum by race and ethnicity, you can see that blacks, Hispanics and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders have lower proportions of receipt of care, retention in care, and viral suppression compared to other race, race and ethnic groups. And then if you look at the same care continuum by risk factors or mode of transmission, we see again lower rates of receipt of care, retention in care, and viral suppression among injection drug users, as we were just hearing from uh, Dr. Camila, male, men who have sex with men and inject drug use and inject drugs, and heterosexual males as well. I think obviously the ultimate measure of how well we're doing with respect to delivering care and treatment is mortality. And so again, here I quickly highlight some CDC data that show that blacks and African Americans have over four times the rate of death compared to the national average um, and, and about seven times um, the rate higher than their white counterparts. So I've shown you a lot of data that's around race, ethnicity, uh, geographic disparities, age disparities, risk disparities. Again, I think it's important to also think about some of these other contextual factors. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention runs a um, study called the Morbidity Monitoring Project, or MMP. And these are data from the 2015 cycle where they get a nationally representative sample of people who are living with HIV um, and ask them uh, many questions about their care trajectories. And so if you recall, earlier in the, in the talk, one of the definitions of vulnerability had to do with being economically or educationally disadvantaged, and I think that these data show that. So 46% of people in the MMP sample were living um, at or below the poverty threshold, and 20% had less than a high school education. We know, of course, that mental health plays a huge role in one's ability to be able to fully engage in care and treatment. And we see here some data, again, from MMP that show that 11 to 12% of people living with HIV are dealing with a diagnosis of either major or other depression. And then they also have the opportunity to ask people living with HIV about their antiretroviral therapy use. And so again, in the sample from MMP, interestingly, 43% of people said that they had never taken antiretroviral therapy because their healthcare provider told them that they shouldn't take it, which gives us pause because we know that the recommendations are that you should be trying to treat everyone. Um, similarly, and I'm sorry that the box kind of jumped there, um, 27% of people who are not currently taking ART um, 
reported a money or insurance problem. So again, this gives us information about the need to improve our um, care delivery structures and of course to make sure that we have um, adequate resources to treat people who are living with HIV and to allow them to have access. When uh, we look at the proportion of people who are actually taking antiretroviral therapies and ask them about adherence, 60% of people took 100% of their prescribed ART doses in 30 days. So only 60% of people were 100% adherent. But yet when they were asked how well they were doing taking their medications, 54% thought that they were doing an excellent job. So this is similar to some of the data that we've seen in DC, where when we ask people who are either out of care or in sporadic care, people kind of cycling in and out of care, you know, where do you see yourself along the HIV care continuum? More than 50% of people who had been out of care for six to 12 months said, I'm fully engaged in care. And then about 95% of people who were doing that cycling, again, said that they were fully engaged in care. So again, I think this is an issue of um, helping people who are living with HIV understand the chronicity of their infection and that the need that they need to continuously engage in care, despite how they may be feeling, despite the fact that they may have achieved viral suppression, that we still need to see them and, and get them back into clinic. And then finally, I think it's important to highlight some of the unmet needs around care delivery. So again, these are data from MMP, and i just show you a sample of some of the um, needs that people living with HIV are reporting, ranging from dental care to meal and food services to transportation assistance. And again, if this resonates with me and some of the work that we've done in DC, where we looked at um, unmet needs. We live in an urban city, it's the nation's capital, and about 50% of people living with HIV told us that they had um, inconsistent access to transportation and inconsistent access to food as well. So these are real data and real needs uh, for people living with HIV. I do want to highlight um, a couple of um, key populations. So first is the burden of HIV among transgender women. We really don't have a lot of data around transgender person. I'll sh persons. I'll show you some of the data that we have. So this was a, a meta-analysis that was conducted by uh, Steph Burrell at Hopkins, where they found that the odds of HIV infection among transgender women was almost 50% and that when they looked at the global prevalence of HIV, it was about 20% or 19%. So again, I think these data highlight that this is a, a population really in dire need of prevention and, um, and treatment access. In the United States, there are about an estimated 1 million people who are transgender, and of them, about 2,400 people are living with HIV. Um, these are data that are available from the CDC, and again, you see that when you look at transgender men and transgender women, respectively, about 50 to 60 percent of those diagnoses are among black or African American um, transgender persons, and that um, similarly, if you look uh, at the Hispanic or Latino burden of HIV among this population, it's 15 to almost 30 percent. Um, there are some MMP data to try to look at the care trajectory of transgender men living with HIV. Um, and here I just wanted to highlight that, again, we see these high burden of um, unmet needs. About 70% had, had at least more than one unmet need. Uh, about 55% had a diagnosis of AIDS. And the last um, column or last row, you can see there that only 60% of people were able to achieve viral suppression and sustain it. And I think I would be remiss if we didn't talk about some of the structural and policy uh, issues that, um, that result in vulnerability. So this slide is just to remind us of the persistence of HIV criminalization laws in the United States and that we have to continue to work uh, to remove some of these laws, remove these laws from the books um, in many states in the United States. And then, of course, similarly, HIV stigma. Without addressing HIV stigma, we are not going to achieve our, our, our goals ultimately. We know that stigma can result in poor emotional well-being, discrimination, violence, and marginalization. And so we need to work collectively and, and holistically to address it. So I've shown you a lot of data around um, how we define these populations, how um, 
disparate care delivery and retention and care can be along the care continuum. And I guess the challenge really is how do we improve viral suppression, that last step in the care continuum, when we know that there's so many other factors, um, so many social determinant factors uh, that influence care delivery. Well, I think the good news is that we have the evidence that we need. We have the science. We have U equals U. We know that treatment as prevention works. We have access to PrEP, or at least we know that we can, uh, we can prescribe PrEP. Um, we've looked at rapid ART initiation, and there's the promise of long-acting injectables as well. So we have the tools to be able to address this epidemic. And more recently, we also seem to have the political and um, hopefully financial support from the US government to end the epidemic. Um, and so you all are all um, probably familiar with the ending the HIV epidemic um, plan that was laid out in February of this, past year, of this year, which focuses on diagnosing, treating, protecting, and responding to the epidemic. And of course, there's a geographical focus um, on those areas that have the highest burden of HIV, including San Juan, Puerto Rico. So what's the evidence that supports our ability and our approaches to improve HIV care and treatment? Uh, so there was an uh, um, article published by the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care in 2015 that provided evidence-based guidelines for optimizing the HIV care continuum. And you can see that there are multiple areas that they say need to be addressed in order to really improve care continuums across the board. Those include optimizing the care environment, increasing HIV testing coverage and linkage to care, increasing treatment coverage, retention, et cetera. And there's also an emphasis on focusing on some of these select key populations. Some of the data, which I've shown you already, makes these populations um, more vulnerable to um, suboptimal outcomes along the care continuum. So I'm going to use this framework from, um, from the IAPAC guidelines to show you and just highlight a few examples of evidence-based um, approaches. So the first is optimizing the HIV care environment. Um, this is a paper that was written by Sevilius and colleagues that focused on barriers and facilitators to engaging and retaining transgender women in care in San Francisco. They did qualitative work. Um, to try to identify some of these factors. And some of the key themes that they came up with were that um, transgender men and women were avoiding health care due to prior negative experiences, that they were prioritizing their hormone therapy over coming to care, and often concerned about adverse reactions between the antiretrovirals and their hormones. And that they highlighted that one of the facilitators of getting people into care and, and remaining in care was the receipt of culturally competent and transgender sensitive health care. And so I just highlight a few um, quotes from that paper, which I thought were pretty telling. So this is one around mental health, where they say, we, the, this participant says, we as black trans women don't want to address mental health because we think it's an ugly thing. We're too busy addressing the hormones and the trans thing and the HIV thing that we're leaving everything else out. We're not dealing with the total package or the total person. Here's a quote around gender affirmation and cultural competence, or lack thereof. Uh, this participant says, you know, I go by my female name, and my identification still says my male name. And with me looking like I do, if they call me by my male name in front of the other patients, I might just walk out. And I don't blame that person. That is not culturally competent care. And then lastly, a quote around resilience. So now that I'm clean and sober, I'm definitely on the right path, I'm proactive, I'm outspoken, I'm an activist, I'm a transgender woman, and I should be afforded every right that someone else is afforded, but I know that I'm not. So what do we do with this information? Um, well, I came across this paper that's going to be published in September by Tonya Petit, Andrea Wirtz, and Sari Reisner, which actually outlines several strategies for engaging the transgender population in HIV prevention and care. And they specifically focus um, in one part of the paper on HIV care and treatment supports. And they recommend things that I think that we've talked about already, um, addressing these social determinants of health, but looking at interventions that might work. So if it's um, collaborating with community outreach or peer interventions, 
making sure that you integrate the criminal justice system and other healthcare organizations and psychosocial needs into the delivery of HIV care needs is important. All of that so that we can create these enabling environments to reduce vulnerability and increase access to HIV services. Another population that we know does not do well along the care continuum is the adolescent population, and I know that is the mother of two adolescents. Um, they are a special population. Um, so this is a study that was Just say conducted. The list. <laughs> What's that? No, no keep going. <laughs> this is a study that was conducted through the Adolescent Trials Network uh, called the SMILE program, and this is a collaboration between 15 uh, Adolescent Trial Network sites, the CDC, NIH, and importantly, the local health departments. Um, the idea was to do community mobilization to be able to get all youth who were diagnosed with HIV between the ages of 13 to 24 into care. And they had successful results. Um, they were ultimately able to engage 91% uh, of these youth, and they were able to um, evaluate the program and found that the time from HIV testing to the time with refer to Sorry, the time from HIV testing to referral was associated with engagement in care and a shorter time engaging in care, and that individuals who um, had that shorter care referral interval were actually more engaged uh, and, and engaged more quickly. So we know that adolescent-focused services work, and this is an example of where we might be able to take this information to inform our policies and approaches so that we can improve the care continuum among adolescents. Uh, engaging incarcerated populations post care, uh, post H, sorry, engaging incarcerated populations in HIV care post release has also been an area of emphasis um, recently with NIDA. So we know that there are about 17,000 people uh, living with HIV in our criminal justice system in the United States. Um, and there has been a collective effort to try to focus on how we can support those individuals not only while they're in care, but as they transition back into the community. I'll just highlight a couple of papers that came out of that initiative. The first is a paper that was conducted by my colleague Irene Coe and uh, colleagues at GW, um, where they tried a computerized counseling sessions with a post-incarceration text messaging approach. Um, to see if that would improve retention and care post-release. Uh, the intervention had a positive but non-significant association actually with viral suppression. There was also a study led by David Wall and colleagues um, in which they did mo motivational interviewing and referral to care within five days of release and also provided access to cell phones. Um, they also found that short term there was an increase in clinic, uh, clinic attendance but also was not effective in maintaining viral suppression. And then finally, a study that did have positive findings that was led by Sandy Springer and her group, which looked at extended release naltrexone um, among people living with HIV who had alcohol use disorders, and they were able to find that uh, positive association in terms of keeping people engaged in their care once they were released into the community. So there's a data harmonization process that's happening um, through this initiative with NIDA, and it'll be interesting to see what interventions come out that are proven to be effective in improving uh, the care continuum among this population. I also wanted to highlight that um, uh, studies that are focused on rapid ART initiation. So um, there are two uh, studies I wanted to highlight, one in Atlanta, the REACH program, and one in San Francisco, the RAPID program. In both of these programs, essentially, uh, patients are diagnosed with HIV, they get a same-day appointment in San Francisco, they get a social uh, needs assessment, they get their labs drawn, and they're started on antiretrovirals immediately. And you can see the results here, essentially, that the time to viral suppression in the groups that reach, that, uh, that have access to that rapid ART initiation are shorter than their control groups. And um, in San Francisco, in particular, they were able to get 95% of their patients on ART within 24 hours, reducing that median time to viral suppression. So important work and work that we are going to be trying to do also in Washington, D.C., as we try to um, address our epidemic there. I wanted to highlight another um, uh, evidence-based um, study that took place. It's called the MAX Clinic. This was a study that was led by Julie Dombrowski and her colleagues at University of Washington, where they created what they considered a low barrier clinic that was tailored to high need patients. 
So I like this example for a couple of reasons. One, it's they didn't wait for people to fall out of care, but they identified those people who were in their clinics who had complex needs, um, had risk factors for falling out of care, they weren't on ART, they weren't virally suppressed, they had a history of being poorly engaged, and they were proactively offering services, so walk-in visits, text messaging, they provided incentives for coming to visits and achieving viral suppression, they even provided food vouchers, um, cell phones, etc. And so when they compared their um, uh, 12 month pre-baseline to their 12 month post-baseline cohort, they did find improvements in viral suppression among the MAPS patients. Interestingly though, they did not see any durable viral suppression. So they didn't see any effect on sustainability of keeping people virally suppressed or engaged in care. Nevertheless, I think that this study highlights two, and the authors say this in their paper, highlights two really important things. One is, this is an attempt to treat people holistically. It's not just enough to deliver their ART um, and to see them in clinic, but to really try to understand what services that they need um, to be able to fully engage in care. The other really important, um, I think, take home message here is that this is an example of what we call differentiated care, which is something that's being used internationally but really hasn't been tried much in the United States. So differentiated care is this concept that it's a client-centered approach. You want to try to simplify and adapt the services to that client's needs. And by doing that, you reduce the unnecessary burden on the health system, but you also are re able to reallocate services to those people most in need. Um, here's the, there are different models of differentiated care, but they argue that you should look at your, the clinical characteristics of your patient, the specific population itself and the context in which care is being delivered. And so on the bottom right here, you see examples of how um, uh, care might be delivered or ART care might be delivered uh, in those settings. And one uh, example that I wanted to highlight is um, a community-based program that takes place in Namibia um, in southern Africa that's aiming to increase HIV treatment coverage by having community-based ART distribution. So I had the opportunity to actually visit this program a couple of years ago. They provide support groups, they provide, provide these community-based ART groups, and also have um, groups that have uh, investments. So they, one of the groups is raising pigs um, to make money for the community. In Namibia, there are about 2.3 million people living with HIV, and they live in very rural areas. So this community-based ART model basically brings people together, identifies one person per month to travel to the nearest health facility. That individual will pick up medications for themselves as well as for other people. They will collect all of the different um, medical ID cards for the people in the group and take those to the health center as well. And this obviously eases the burden on all of the patients because not everyone needs to travel to the health facility, but it also decreases the burden on the health facility as well. And I think importantly, and what I observed firsthand, is that this, these groups also, also provide um, very uh, good psych psychosocial support to each other in their communities and help reduce that stigma around HIV. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was just the importance of patients, uh, and sorry, the patient-provider relationship. Um, and so I think we all know that this is an essential relationship. There's a paper by Kim Koster and colleagues where they highlight um, uh, this idea of the good patient and that sometimes patients want to do the best that they can and they want to have a good relationship with their provider, but if they're not able to achieve that goal and they feel like they're letting the provider down, that actually causes them to disengage in care. And so that they need to, we need to establish these kind of central tenets of that patient-provider relationship which are personalization, access, commitment, and a therapeutic alliance. And I do want to take a moment, I know I'm over time, but um, if you haven't looked or listened to David Malbranch's um, talk at IAS in 2018 in Amsterdam, I think it's really important, um, to, and I encourage you to do that, and the link is here on the slides. He argues that we need to, as clinicians and clinics, think of ourselves as restaurants. If you open a restaurant and people come, and then they only come once and they don't come back, you don't blame the participant or the patron. You look at the restaurant, right? You say, is the name of the restaurant stigmatizing? Um, is, the, is the care that we deliver or the food that we deliver doesn't taste good? Maybe it wasn't fresh. Um, you know, did we not treat our, our patrons with respect? And he argues that we need to have the same approach as we think about HIV care delivery. 
um, in the clinical setting. So how can we improve that patient-provider relationship? Well, let's ask the community, what do they need? What are their priorities? What are their challenges? Listen to your patients and establish a shared decision-making relationship. And as providers, I think it's important that we address our own implicit or explicit biases as well. Think about the language that you use when you talk to your patients. You know, are you asking them what their preferred pronouns are? Do they want to be referred to as a person living with HIV or an HIV positive person? I think all of these are things that we need to consider as we try to model the next generation for the next generation of HIV providers as we go forward. So We've heard a lot of talks about HIV in Puerto Rico, and I, I just wanted to put this here to acknowledge that, um, you know, I recognize that these are issues that are faced in among the among people living with HIV in, in San Juan and Puerto Rico as well. It's clear that there is a very complex epidemic here with injection drug users and men who have sex with men and heterosexuals all um, constituting people living with HIV. And while I didn't mention it as a vulnerability in the talk, I think it's also important to think about sexually transmitted infections and how those may make someone more vulnerable to HIV as well. Particularly uh, here in Puerto Rico where we see very high rates of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and particularly primary and secondary syphilis. <coughs> So in conclusion, I think vulnerability is subjective and contextual. Um, in the end, I think, you know, broadly speaking, we could say all persons are affected by HIV in some way. And we know that that care and treatment uh, dynamic is complex. But I think that we do have the tools and the data to really improve the lives of people living with HIV. In order to address some of these gaps and disparities, we're going to have to have a multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary approach. I think there's a role for everyone, patients, providers, policymakers, government and community, if we're going to ultimately achieve these goals. And I also would urge you to look at lessons learned from some of other areas, whether they're global, whether they're from other cities in the United States, and also from your patients themselves. So let's think creatively and comprehensively about how we can best respond to improving care and treatment among these populations. And I'll just end with a quote from Carl Diefenbach. Um, this was something that he said at the end of this last IAS meeting about um, how we're going to address uh, these populations. He said, quote, we aren't gonna say hard to reach. This puts the burden on us as physician scientists. We have the problem and we need to solve this. So I challenge you all to do that and thank you for your attention. <laughs>